welcome to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, Specialist Payroll Recruiters. Hello and welcome to the Payroll Podcast. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to be sat with Rebecca Mullins, Associate Director of the Payroll Advisory Practice at Deloitte. I've known Rebecca since 2006, so I'm really excited to have her on the pod because I know she has a wealth of payroll expertise in fields ranging from global payroll, payroll transformation, project management, payroll strategy, models, payroll applications, and payroll vendors, along with an awful lot more as well, which I think we'll find out during the course of this podcast. All in all, Becca possesses 19 years experience working in both payroll operations and consulting, and she's also a fellow of the CIPP. To add credence to all of this, Becca has been named in the Payroll World Top 50 for both 2015 and 2016, as well as the Reward Strategies Reward Top 300 for 2018. Right now, Becca is responsible for leading the Deloitte UK Payroll Advisory Practice, where she has been involved in project managing many standalone payroll projects, as well as the payroll aspects of some impressive large-scale global transformations. These are two areas I'm keen to discuss in more detail during the course of this pod, so please stay tuned. Becca has also worked on both vendor and client side on projects which involve function reviews, global risk and compliance assessments, requirements gathering and documentation, vendor selection and product evaluation. With all this experience, I can already see this is going to be an information packed podcast. So let's get started. Welcome, Becca, to the pod. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Thank you very much for having me and for that wonderful introduction. Five quick questions. Becca, many payroll professionals will be looking up to you and wondering how they can progress their own careers to reach a similar level within payroll. Therefore, I wondered if you would, if you could just provide a quick overview of how you got into payroll and the steps that led to you to becoming Associate Director for what essentially is one of the largest financial professional services consultancies in the world at Deloitte. So as you said in my introduction, I've got over 19 years payroll experience, and that's gained from a variety of, a whole different variety of different areas that I've worked in. As many people do, I fell into payroll. I worked for a large retailer doing their control accounts and then moved to a much smaller organization in their finance team. And the person who did payroll went off sick. And as we all wanted to be paid, I picked it up. Unfortunately, it was a real baptism of fire because the payroll system we were using was so basic. We had a lot of employees that were sales-based, um, so being paid commission, and the payroll system didn't accept decimal points. Okay. So having to put their values in for their commission was horrible because you had to draw where the decimal point would be to work it out. That system is, is so old and, and it's not used anymore, which is great for everybody. Once I left that company, I then moved to a payroll vendor and implemented their payroll system. So really got to see about building payroll systems and the capabilities they have. Did that for a couple of years and then left and went to a financial organization where I processed their payroll and then help them implement a brand new system as well. By the time that had been implemented, it kind of got to the end of the two years. And that's at that point where I was kind of staying in the jobs for about two years and decided to move on and was lucky enough to be on the healthcare implementation at the time. It was the third large historical implementation in the world. And that was a fascinating project just to see how they brought on a company, an organisation that huge, onto a payroll system. Following on from that project, I then came to Deloitte, where I've been now for 11 years, leading our payroll advisory practice. So built it up from the ground, from scratch, defining what we do in our services and offerings, building a great team that I've got working for me today and delivering some excellent projects for clients. Fantastic. So you have essentially developed your experience from both starting in operational payroll then getting the experience in implementation, which gave you some good hybrid skills. I guess, which has allowed you to pick up a role working with one of the biggest consultancies delivering both operational and implementation projects, which is great. I think that's important because you need to, to know actually how payroll operates in, in reality. Sure. It's great to go in and, and deliver someone a new process and a new way of working. But actually, if you don't understand how their payroll operates in a day-to-day business, it's very difficult to kind of give them a new process to follow that's actually going to work for them and be embedded and accepted by them. So how's the practice look different than now from when you started 11 years ago to where you are now? You've got a great team. It's obviously expanded. It's obviously got bigger. How has that looked? How's that changed? I think the variety of experience that we've got in the team. So we've had people that uh, used to run clients' payrolls. We've got people that used to run in-house payrolls. We've got people very much focused on the RPA side of things. And we've got people with great project management experience to implement solutions and systems. So there's a whole variety. And we've all used different systems and we've all worked in different industries. Right. So the sort of breadth and depth of knowledge that we've got across this industry is amazing. Excellent. Fantastic. So obviously at Deloitte over 11 years, you've had a, a really varied role. Obviously, you've been paid advisory consultancy services. Things are changing all the time as well. Presumably, each client will come to you with 
a very unique payroll problem. We all know each payroll is very unique to, to the next. So presumably that will require a very bespoke potential solution or strategy to or consulting approach to handle the unique problems. So with that in mind, can you, are you able to provide any examples of the kind of payroll projects you've been asked to be involved in and how they vary? As you say, my role here over 11 years is so different and so varied, and the projects we do reflect that. No two projects are the same. You know, Clients ask us to help them with their vendor selection, and it's completely different to any ones that we've done in the past um, for a whole variety of different reasons. Some examples of some of the projects. So we've done global strategy development for a large manufacturing company. They're always fascinating to do because most global companies will have a number of large countries with very large employee populations and then a whole raft of smaller countries and actually finding a solution and a service that fits all of those countries and actually delivers the service they need in all those countries can be quite challenging to find. But actually, when you find one that works and when you see it operationally and the benefits it can bring them, it, it's amazing to see. Um, we've done vendor selection for airlines, focusing on the UK. That was very complicated because of their raft of terms and conditions. They had so many varied ones. Actually finding one system that could cope with all their different terms and conditions was was fascinating, as well as seeing actually some of the terms and conditions they were paying people. Personally, my favourite is payroll reviews because you go in and you see the problems that people are having. And by the end of the project, when we've delivered our recommendations and helped them implement that, you can see how much better everyone's working day is and how much more enthused the teams are to be delivering the services that they're delivering. Excellent. It's very much an agnostic service, isn't it? Which is which is kind of different because you know I deal with a lot of the vendors, the big vendors that people know out there, and obviously that's not agnostic because they're supporting their own solution. But being a consulting service, it's very much an agnostic view you'd be doing or an agnostic vendor selection. Does that throw up any different challenges? I think because we've got the breadth and depth of knowledge of the different systems out there and have worked with the majority of payroll vendors in the marketplace. It doesn't matter that they're all very, very different. And I think that's one of the great things that we bring to the projects is that we are agnostic. We bring to the client the best solution for them rather than one of two or three that we're tied to if we were down the road of partnerships with vendors. And would it predominantly be the payroll manager that came to you for this kind of service? Or would it be a CEO or director or HR director? Or does it, does it change? It changed. It really does change. So it depends where finance or where payroll sits in the, in the business. Sometimes sure. it's in HR, sometimes it's in finance. Um, sometimes it's procurement that comes to us. Okay. Um, we've had a variety of projects recently where procurement have been undertaking these types of projects. IT as well. So yeah. we did a implementation for a large manufacturer a few years back where the IT department had made the decision that all the data for that business was going to be moved into the cloud. So they were the ones driving that project, which is unusual because it's usually HR or sure. payroll that are driving an implementation project. Fantastic. I know the four key areas of Deloitte's advisory practice helps with tend to be related to either, as you mentioned, so you love payroll reviews, and they also have payroll strategy, uh, payroll and technology platform selection, or payroll implementation, and you mentioned some vendor selection work as well. Right now, which areas in most demand? So we see payroll reviews consistently throughout the year for a variety of reasons, because that doesn't really go in, in sort of peaks and troughs, because people are always having challenges with operating sure. their payroll for a whole variety of reasons. Where we do see trends is around the payroll selection strategy work. So it kind of goes in cycles. So at the start, when Global Payroll first came out, we saw a lot of clients looking to do their strategy and implement a global service. Now that we're moving on to the second generation of of Global Payroll services, people are starting to reevaluate. So it kind of swings from the implementation of the payroll and the strategy to actually defining what that should be or redefining what it should be. What kind of thing does a review consist of? Operationally, what kind of reviews do you get asked to do? It can range from anything. It can range from a tiny little bit of the payroll that we're looking at. So, for example, the submission of data to the revenue is, is one area that we've looked at recently where people have got challenges with what's being recorded on the dashboards to, okay, as to what sure, they've sent. Sure. Or it could be a full-scale review. So, for an airline recently, we're looking at their service from their payroll vendor. But actually, we widened that out to look at what they were doing internally as well. And it wasn't just within payroll. We looked, we looked at HR as well because of all the data flows that were coming from HR into payroll, which were causing some of the challenges, and then from payroll into the payroll vendor, which again was causing some of the challenges. So it can be a tiny little aspect of payroll, or it can be the full scale, everything, all singing or dancing. Fantastic. Obviously, payroll and HR are sort of more aligned than ever now anyway, with the base of technology improving. Yes. So certainly in, in payroll recruitment, we're seeing the role of the payroll function changing faster than probably ever before at the moment, predominantly due to it moving away from what has historically always been an administrative focused function. You mentioned when you first started in payroll, it was you know, looking at decimal points and you know, very, very manual in the days of Kalamazoo and podcasts and things like that. But it's, it's now moving much more to a strategic function, which I think is a good thing for the industry. 
Subsequently, for us, we're seeing an increase in businesses deciding to outsource its payroll operations, and that can be either to global or regional service providers. Why do you think this is? I think there's four reasons. I think it's efficiency and rationalisation. More and more global companies are starting to understand just what they're using to run payroll and realising that there's a whole multitude of different vendors and contracts out there that they're using. Sure. So there's a huge area for, for rationalisation. The growth of shared service centres is yeah. driving the efficiency side of things. So if you've got a shared service centre processing the payroll for 16 countries, it's not efficient to have 16 different payroll systems being used or 16 different vendors being used by that shared service centre. So efficiency and, and rationalisation. And then you've also got the technology and the legislation as well. Again, with a shared service centre, having somebody within there that understands the legislation for the countries you're processing is impossible. It's very difficult to find people with those types of skills and knowledge. So outsourcing it to a vendor who will take on the majority of that responsibility for the legislation for you, because you never ultimately give up the responsibility of your payroll if you outsource sure. it. I guess they take on the risk. They take on the risk. Yeah. And they're the ones that are the experts in that country in that legislation. So why would you struggle to do it yourself when there is a vendor out there that sure. has the expertise? And also technology as well, the main systems in the marketplace to be able to run the payrolls for you. So why struggle internally with the system and have the maintenance of that? Why not outsource it to a third party? Sure. And obviously, we've been through some huge legislative changes over the last few years. We've seen the introduction of RTI. Which of those or which of the most recent legislative changes going back over the last, say, 12 to 24 months have had the biggest impact on companies coming to you for advice, review or assistance? I'd say national minimum wage has had a huge impact. We've done a lot of work with clients trying to understand how to pay employees. And it's not just the obvious parts around someone's age and and what to pay them. It's all the other bits and pieces that make up their wages that are impacted by NMW. So you've got things like uniforms, how you make the deductions or how you equate the value of their uniform if they've got to wear a uniform that they've got to divide themselves, how you equate that to, to a salary to then calculate their NMW. And things like overtime as well has a huge impact on an MW. So I'd say that's the, probably the biggest legislation. And it's a focus at the moment of the revenue. And is there any legislation you're aware of that might be due to be released or coming out that you think is going to have a similar kind of impact? I think IR35 for the private sector is going to have a huge impact. Yeah. Uh, the assessment of the workers to identify if they're an employee or not sure. is going to take a huge amount of time and effort for companies when you think about the number of contractors potentially companies have working for them. More and more, we're seeing that, that people are having to identify where these people are. And if, if they're not on the HR system and you don't have a proper record of who you've got in the business, it's very difficult to make sure that you're compliant and know that you've captured everybody to do that assessment. The other aspect of it is the data you're going to need on that employee to be sure. able to make the assessment because you then start to hit things like GDPR. So yeah. understanding what you can gather and what you need to gather and getting that right bit of information to be able to make that assessment, because ultimately it's the client that has to make the assessment. It's not the agency you've got the sure. person from. So making sure you've got that data from the agency to be able to make that assessment is going to be a challenge for people. It's not a great example as well of just how complex payroll can be, you know, at the granular level. Yeah. And sometimes people, you know, outside of payroll don't realise just how complex it is and how much you've got to take on board and how quickly it changes. No, so, it's yes. not just data entry and button pushing. Definitely not, definitely not. And you mentioned um, compliance on IR35 essentially coming in and obviously national minimum wage. It, compliance is always a hot topic in payroll. It's always a hot topic within any organisation. You mentioned GDPR as well being you know, huge compliance issues which has affected every business in the UK, no matter how, how large or small you might be. But payroll compliance, as I just mentioned, is incredibly complex you could recommend some, I don't know, some practical steps potentially that listeners can take away from this podcast that they can then go and implement, perhaps help ensure that their payroll operations are compliant and if there are any sort of compliance pitfalls that maybe they can look out for so they can protect themselves? Compliance is a huge area and it's also a very interesting area. I think practical steps would include review. You've got to review what you're doing, whether it's weekly, monthly, quarterly, however frequently you need to do that. You need to review what you're actually doing. Payroll people are busy. Uh, you know, we're not just sitting around for uh, for two weeks of each month waiting for payroll to start, but actually making sure you've got the time to actually do those reviews properly in the right areas is, is critical. I think there'll be different areas of focus for different industries. So depending on where you work, for example, retail and manufacturing have got very different complexities to sales-based staff or head office-based staff. So actually understanding what you need to be compliant for those particular industries and those particular workers is a, is a key point. And I think awareness and involvement of the changes is another key step, making sure that you know what's coming up and how it's going to impact your business. Payroll are often the last to know 
when something's sure. changing within a business to, and know the impacts of that. So, for example, if you're changing a shift pattern or bringing in a new type of employee, you know, payroll needs to be involved in those conversations right at the very, very beginning to be able to to give their advice and guidance yeah. to, to shape how you're going to operate this, um, as well as then be able to build the technologies, the interfaces and the processes and procedures to be able to cater for these employees. Excellent. I know that obviously a lot of power professionals are very concerned with the statutory legislative compliance and some of the things you mentioned there, which is obviously which is dealing with every single day. You've spoken before about issues that you know, outside of the statutory compliance of like the laws are important for people to consider. So you're able to tell listeners something about some of the other areas perhaps they should be considering in relation to compliance, it could also have a significant impact on employee experience if they're not managed correctly. So whilst legislative compliance is critical to a payroll team, there are a variety of others. So there's obviously the contractual obligations, making sure you're paying people correctly and on time, and again, in line with their terms and conditions. You've also got ethical compliance. So depending on where your business is located, there may be green policies you've got to adhere to. Again, that's, that's going to be critical for the terms and conditions and actually how you pay people and the schemes and benefits you're providing. And then you've also got, if you've got a multinational country, multinational payroll, you've also got cultural compliance as well. Understanding the nuances of how you pay people and how you deal with people in various countries can be huge. Getting it wrong, you're going to impact the employee experience and open the, the company up to reputational damage, potential fines and penalties. Sure, I think the brand damage is something that is often underestimated. Mm-hmm. You know, payroll has, as I mentioned in the previous podcast, has a direct effect on employee attrition. You know, people's pay is incorrect or their issues or you're fine and, you know, it can have a direct effect on mm-hmm. people working within that function. If they don't trust the payroll, don't trust that they're going to get paid on time, mm-hmm. eventually they're going to look elsewhere. So I think it's really, really good to, to emphasize how important it is to get it right. I think especially now as the revenue are publishing lists of people that have been, been non-compliant. Sure. And actually you can just Google company's names before you go and interview with them you google to see something about the company you don't want the first thing that comes up is is something around non-compliance because it's going to shape your view of potentially a future employer absolutely absolutely fantastic well we're going to go into the next section which is to find out a little bit more about you time to find out more about you how would your friends describe you rebecca and how would your work colleagues describe you it's always a difficult one to answer i think friends would describe me as funny loyal and kind and I think work colleagues, probably thoughtful, supportive, and a perfectionist with an eye for detail. Okay. Any examples of your perfectionism? Is that a word? Um, my team hate it because I can look at PowerPoint slides and tell them things aren't aligned or in a different colour or a different font okay. and something's slightly off. Your PowerPoint OCD? Slightly. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Tell me something about you then perhaps other people won't know about you. I'm an adult fan of Lego. I can, okay, cool. yeah, I can happily spend a while away a weekend building a new model. Uh, so recently we've had the Hogwarts model yeah. was released, which is looking very impressive on my kitchen table. It replaced the Taj Mahal, which was getting a little bit too, too big wow. and taking up too much space. So I had to take that down. But yeah, some of the new model, Lego models that are coming out are great. That's definitely something that I didn't know. I've got to ask, what's the most impressive thing you've brought out of Lego? It was always the newest thing that I've got, which I always think is more impressive. I think the Taj Mahal, because I had to wait for it to be re-released because they ceased selling it around about 2007. You could buy it for about three grand. And I thought, I'm not spending wow. that much on Lego. But they re-released it last Christmas, so I got a little bit overexcited and pre-ordered that. Do you, do you keep them built afterwards? For a while, I keep them up, but then I usually replace it with something that's that's come out and that's more new. Fantastic. Excellent. Uh, it's a little bit different. We always do this in the podcast. So if you are abducted by aliens and you want to know more about our species, what item would you take with you? I think it's an obvious one that everyone said. It's an iPhone. Why would you take an iPhone? I think because of the way they've just taken over our lives and you can do so much with them and on them, people spend so much time attached to them. I think it's probably the, the most obvious thing. Would you continue working at it with you? Would you working miles with you? Well, it depends if I had Wi-Fi. Because surely <laughs> if I was abducted with them and went on, off in their spaceship, it depends if it had Wi-Fi. Fair enough. Good point. Good point, well made. What game or instrument would you teach them? I would teach them a card game, Canasta. I don't know many other people who can play it. I think I've ever heard of it. <laughs> Exactly. So if I taught someone else to play it, then I could play it with them rather than having to play against computers and computer programs. Well, this class is made with ordinary playing cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit like poker, but okay. you don't gamble on it as much. Okay. I'll have to check it out. Great. And what would you tell them about humans? I think I'd tell them that we're a very unpredictable, complex species. And trying to, trying to understand this, I think, is, is near and impossible. Just when you think you've got to a point where you do, something happens and you just think, I have no understanding of this. Fantastic. Great answer. Five quick questions. 
I'm going to build back in. I want to find out more about your 19 years' experience in payroll and try and find out a bit more how that's uh, well, your influence on the industry, really. So you've obviously seen the industry change a lot during the last 19 years. How does payroll compare now to what it was like when you first started? I know you touched upon some of the manual processes you were first involved in, but what else have you seen change? I think in some ways it's changed a lot, and in other ways it's, it's not changed at all. You know, I still remember implementing a payroll solution for a client years ago, which had proration, and they thought that was black magic. There's still systems out there today that don't have that. In some ways it has, and in some ways it hasn't. I think the way it hasn't changed is around data. Payroll is still expected to be the data owners of the data they're processing and also the correctors of that data when actually they're not the owners. They're not responsible for that that data, but they're still expected to fix it and be responsible for it and answer all the questions and queries about it. You know, if a manager signs off someone's timesheet, payroll shouldn't have to be the one that checks that and say it looks a bit odd, it doesn't look right, are you sure they did this number of hours? The manager needs to take responsibility for what they've signed off. Sure. Payroll should just be processing it. And in that way, it frees payroll up to do the more strategic, more interesting things for them to do and actually add value back to the business. Because if they're spending all their time checking data and correcting data, that's not bringing a huge amount of value from their knowledge and their skill set to the business. Sure. Einstein famously said that insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We believe it's time to try a new approach to recruitment. JGA Recruitment specialise in recruiting the top 15% of payroll and HR talent using innovative 24-7 attraction strategies that are proven to improve quality of hire, candidate retention and return on investment. De-risk your recruitment process today and hire better talent faster with JGA Recruitment. Visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. I mean, something we're really passionate about on the podcast is um, talking about elevating the industry, bringing it to the forefront of people's minds, and, and really, I guess, talking about how complex and important it is for any business to run smoothly, to have a really good, efficient, compliant function you know, underneath that. Have you seen the power industry elevate itself in the last 19 years you've been in it? Because I know when I first started in recruitment 16 years ago, it was very much a back office no windows, one person sat in a corner, sort of close to the I think it's changed loads since then. I think it has a lot more, a much greater voice within business functions. But have you seen, in your estimation, have you seen the, the business rise or is it still a long way to go? I think it's still got a long way to go. Um, I think it's got more of a voice than it did. I think with a lot of the changes that are making it more visible, things like pension auto enrollment and RTI, I think that's helped elevate it. But I still think there's a, there's a long way to go. Even within businesses, having having someone that actually champions payroll and is responsible for it globally and actually sure. is a senior person, so either C-suite or sits on the board, actually fights payroll's corner and, and elevates it at that level, I think, is, is critical. We did a project recently for a global firm that's got multiple entities within a country are in multiple countries. And there was a huge amount of rationalization and cost savings and efficiency that, that could be gained by that business, but because they ultimately didn't have one person responsible for payroll at the sort of top group level, there was no drive and there was no desire across the rest of the business to actually change the way they were working because payroll was just thought of as a back office function. Presumably there was no realisation they could improve it or save costs. They didn't understand it and completely underestimated how much money they could potentially save or how much they could improve things. Mm. And they had a huge number of different vendors across each of the entities. And actually some of them were the same vendors in multiple countries, in multiple entities, that they all had separate contracts. So again, it was a huge amount of rationalisation that could be done. But because each business owned payroll and thought of it as the back office function and there wasn't a huge amount of noise coming out of payroll thought everything was fine and that there was nothing to touch there so I didn't want to invest in the project from your perspective i mean you're operating at associate director level at deloitte huge huge international consultancy firm if i was a, an operational payroll manager now who had aspirations to put yourself at the top of the profession and i'm not someone that obviously did it earlier in my career what kind of advice would you potentially be able to give them to say actually you know, if you start getting involved in x why, or maybe you should try and increase your knowledge in you know, A, B, or C. What would those, and what would that advice look like if you're able to, if I was listening to this now and really wanted to make that progression, there would be nowhere to go? I think you've got to make your own opportunities in life. Actually drive that yourself within, within payroll. For example, implementation, it's very difficult to get involved in an implementation if your company isn't going through one, because you're just not going to get that opportunity. But it's kind of a bit like shoehorning yourself into other areas within the business. So, for example, if you see that, for example, finance are going through a transformation and implementation or HR are, then both of those areas are impacted by payroll. Sure. So it's actually kind of forcing yourself into that project and shooting yourself in and saying, actually, you need to be thinking about 
about payroll and me in this project. So we've done a lot of projects where there's been an HR or a finance transformation and they've taken the decision that payroll's out of scope without fully realising that actually if you rip out an HR system, how's the data going to get into payroll? In the same way with finance, if you change all your finance systems, how's that data from payroll going to get sure. into the finance system? So actually it's about being vocal yourself and finding those opportunities to, to get yourself into those projects and to give those opportunities. So, for example, if you see something that's going on within your company that's going to impact payroll, speak up and actually say to them, you know, I'd like to be involved in that meeting. Payroll has something to say in this. Sure. It will impact payroll. Externally, there's a huge amount of opportunities to get involved in things. So you know, CIPP are always looking for people to be on panels and be involved in roundtable discussions. Get involved in those. It'll increase your knowledge and also give you a voice to be able to speak speak up about it. And then from what you learn about those meetings or at conferences, you can take back into the business and say, actually, this is what's happening. This is coming. So there's new legislation or something that can actually drive improvements within your team and actually could drive to you having an implementation. And then you learn on the job. Excellent. Fantastic advice. Brilliant. So with some of the challenges we know are ahead of us in payroll coming through, what do you think in your mind and what you're seeing in the industry, what are the most positive challenges, if you like, that are going to hit the industry in terms of going forward if we could go and improve the industry? I think RPA is going to have a huge positive impact on payroll. I think people are a bit fearful of it, but actually the benefits it can bring are going to be huge. It's not going to replace people. It's sure. not going to replace whole processes. It's going to replace the tasks. Yes, there will be some people that are quite happy sitting there doing data input and data entry, but the majority of people don't particularly enjoy that aspect of their job. So if you can replace that with a robot, it frees you up to do the much more interesting things. Robots can do programmed tasks they can follow programmed sort of instructions as, as you will um they can't do the thinking behind things sure. and the analysis of things so that frees up humans to do that that aspect of the work which is usually what payroll people don't get the time to do because they're too busy doing the manual input so when things like new legislation comes in or something weird and wonderful is happening it will give you the time to think about that and how will it impact it how can i improve this what can i do about it rather than sitting there thinking well i can't spend too much time thinking about that i've got a stack of timesheets to keep yeah i totally agree i've been quite vocal on the subject myself anyway and um, obviously i recently joined a, a deloitte breakfast meeting which was very much focused on uh, robotic process automation or rpa i think there's obviously there was a study released which scared people because it said there was 97 percent of chance that the payroll position would be automated and i think what we need to establish is it's not the role that we automated it's tasks within the role i'd also argue that the data mm-hmm. input people aren't really payroll people anyway they're Data yeah. input people. And I think we have to be clear about the distinction. You know, payroll people are those that can genuinely process and understand and you know, the complexities of legislation that go behind it. We're not just sat there on the piece of entry data without the knowledge behind. So I think it's a really important distinction. I totally agree. It's going to free up payroll professionals to get much more involved in the strategy side of things, which I think sometimes they don't have the time to do at the moment because they are too bogged down with the data. So from your perspective, how do you view RPA in the workplace, knowing what you know, working from within a large consulting practice like Deloitte? What advice would you give to a payroll manager who wanted to future-proof its payroll operation in relation to RPA? As we both said, I think it's a huge enabler for payroll and will change the function dramatically. I think the best bit of advice is think big. So think actually, ultimately, what does the function look like? But actually start very small. So start with one or two looking at one or two processes and the tasks within those processes and pick out the tasks that are either taking a lot of time or there are often challenges with in terms of accuracy from, from the input for whatever reason. Start on those those tasks and those processes. And once that's the robot for that is embedded and everyone's happy with it and everyone's accepted it, you can then start to build out and add more and more tasks for the robot to do. The first time you implement it, people are a little bit scared and think, oh, you know, a robot's done this or sure. I've just got an email from a robot. This is a bit odd. But actually, the more you get used to it, it just becomes second nature and, and something that's there and, and working. And once people realize it's not going to get rid of 10, 15 people, they realize actually it's, it's making a huge benefit to this team and making our lives much more interesting. Attention to detail is so critical for the payroll professional. Mm-hmm. And I guess there's going to be a slight concern about trusting that it works. So if you start small and then realise it works, rather than go wholesale straight into massive changes, mm. then once you start to trust it and see that it works and see why you're actually saving your time, which is a real issue for health professionals at the moment, I guess you can scale later. Yeah, and I think once you see, see it in operation and see it replacing that task, we've got some videos where we actually slow down the process completely and you can see the data being moved from 
effectively a PDF, which sure. you kind of think, oh, how's that going to get from a PDF form into a system? And you can see the robot scraping that data and then effectively keying it into the system. Once you actually see what it's doing and understand it, and actually when you start to build them as well, because you'll see that it's basically a rules-based engine underneath. And once you program those rules, it just keeps repeating and keeps following them and doing what it's supposed to do. So typically, I'm not a pale professional, so I'm going to ask yourself if you know what the answer might be. But if you are losing 40% of your time due to data input at the moment, and you get that 40% of time back, what kind of pale strategic tasks would you look to get involved in if you suddenly had that free time available? If you were working back at an operational level again, how would you start using that free time? There's a variety. So I think future-proofing, which we've talked about, but future-proofing your failed department, seeing what's coming up legislation-wise and training. You know, it's one of the areas that people often neglect because they're so busy. Actually get yourself on training courses, whether it's a refresher course for something you think you know about but may have changed slightly over the past few years, something brand new to you actually start to, to do those types of activities, add value back into the business. So again, things like when the IR35, when they decide to release that, you can start to do those those activities and it'll free you up to do those activities so you're not spending hours and hours outside of normal working time having to do that in order to meet the deadlines. Fantastic. Now, I know you're quite passionate about getting businesses to embrace the work that health professionals do at board level. Can you let listeners know why you think this is important and the implications of this business could face if they don't? I think we've touched on, on quite a lot of them around sort of the reputation of payroll and the work people are doing. If people aren't happy and if they're doing a lot of manual repetitive tasks, you're going to get a huge turnover of staff sure. because not everyone wants to do that. There will be some, but not everyone wants to do that. So you're going to constantly get, you know, churn of, of staff and a not happy payroll team. People think when there's no noise coming out of payroll that everything's happy and everyone's working okay and there's, there's absolutely no problems. But what you actually usually find is that they've got past the point of making the noise because when they did make the noise, nothing was being done about it because there wasn't the senior support around that. Payroll is a pure cost of business. Unless you've operated in shared services where you're processing the payrolls for other companies or other bodies around you, it is just a pure cost of business. So actually, people don't want to spend money on it. They have to anyway because of salaries, but people don't want to spend money on improving it. But actually freeing up that time to be able to, to say, look, this is what's happening. This is what we need to be able to do. And having senior support to say, well, actually, this isn't the right way. We're, we're doing things. We're doing things manually. We're at risk of being non-compliant. And having someone senior understand that to actually drive what we do, it's going to be great for the business and great for the reputation of the payroll team. Totally agree. So if I was a, a CEO, for example, and I came to you and said, look, all I know is we've got a, I'm a big business, multi-million pound business, whatever it might be. I've got a payroll function. All I understand is payroll pays people. I don't really know much more than that. I know it's very expensive because all I do is pay the wages and a lot going out for that function. What are the things you would highlight to me as a CEO to say, actually, we don't just pay people. We could also you know, save money here or improve this, or we also get involved in X. Perhaps I may not be familiar with it, but I've overlooked it as a function because I'm involved in other areas of business. What are the kind of things you would highlight to me as a CEO? I think employee engagement is a huge one. So if you haven't got a happy, engaged workforce because they're too busy worrying about not being paid correctly, you know, that's going to impact the whole of the business because of productivity, Absolutely. you know, high turnover. We've you talked about on previous podcasts, you know, people leaving and, and Googling other people's yeah, businesses around accurate paying people. So I think there's a huge impact on the employee engagement piece. Everyone's looking at the moment about the future of work and the different ways of working. Payroll has a huge impact on that. So you can't just suddenly say, fine, everyone can work from home because there's payroll implications for that. Sure. So actually having payroll involved in those conversations and part of of those kind of strategies and development is going to be a huge benefit to the business because of the knowledge and experience and the understanding that payroll can bring. Excellent. Fantastic. So last question before we go to open the vault. With new technologies being implemented, developed or talked about every day, such as artificial intelligence, AI, blockchain, which I've done some articles on recently, uh, robotic process automation, which we've discussed today, chatbots, which I know some people in the industry are, are a little bit nervous about, but we're seeing coming into play. Which technologies do you think will impact the payroll industry the most in the next two to five years? Definitely RPA, and we, we've talked about that. Sure. It's here. It's working. You shouldn't be scared of it. It can bring great benefits to your business um, relatively quickly as well. It doesn't take long for a simple robot to be implemented. What are the timescales, roughly? If, it was a, if you're starting small, and I said that I came to the right, I want to embrace RPA, I want to start small and scale, like what we suggest here, Typically, one of the timescales to getting one of these processes standardized, set out, 
implemented? I think for the first one that you do, it'll take a long time or longer because you need to really think about it and understand what it is you're doing. And then there's a setup of it as well. So you need to give it access to the right systems, set it up correctly with the right user profiles within the system so that, for example, if you're running an audit report, you can still see what the robot has done within the system because you don't want you don't want to exclude that from the audit trail because otherwise you're not going to know how that change has been made. Sure. So I think setup is probably, for the first time, probably the, the biggest part of it. And you shouldn't rush it with the first one. You need to get it right to enable the adoption of that. Oh, those people are going to start rejecting yeah. rejecting it. So I think with the sort of design phase and the kind of ask the possible exercise you're going to need to go through, you're probably talking two to three months with the first okay. one. But then adding new tasks onto to that robot's kind of profile of what it's doing can be done relatively quickly. So once you set up and you start scaling, scaling gets much yeah. quicker. And they're very, very easy to configure as well and code. It's just a bit, bit more than a macro. So it's kind of taking the macro functionality up a couple of levels. Sure. So if you sure. can do build those, you can build robots to do a variety what, of things. What other technologies do you think are going to impact the industry in the future? I think chatbots is probably the other area, but I think that's more of the HR side of things. People are becoming much happier to interact with a chatbot and ask them frequently asked questions. There will be some questions that you need to speak to a human about to actually get the answer. So, for, you know, really personal questions or you know, grievances and disciplinaries and stuff, sure. you're not going to want to start interacting with a chatbot on that. But your basic questions of how much maternity am I entitled to? What's my holiday balance? And everyone's favourite payroll question, when am I being paid in December? You know, put it through a chatbot. You know, the, the standard answers that chatbots can come back with really quickly and some of them actually have, um, some of the programs have, you know, images where it does look like you're speaking to more of a human than just sure. a kind of a robot image. I think um, in a previous podcast, Max mentioned the idea of bringing in interactive payslips, which I think is quite interesting. So when you actually look at your payslip, you can click on any part of it and it will tell you how it's calculated. It will take through to a chapel, potentially, or answer any questions you have through your own payslips. That's one of his future ideas, wow. which I think is quite interesting. Yes, because again, it will get rid of a lot of questions around, you know, why am I being only being paid eight hours overtime when I did 10? Yes. Because it will show you, Absolutely. I presume, the sort of time system in the back end of it, and you'll see that two hours haven't been approved. Sure. So you actually you know who to speak to then and ask the question to rather than just finding up payroll, who will only tell you that we only processed eight hours because that's all that was approved. It's quite interesting, though, because historically, also you have chatbots there, you'd always get the, the complaints coming in, your payroll wasn't right, and you'd be dealing with those. And communication skills were important in payroll, but really it was the skills behind being able to manually calculate and answer a of questions that came in knowledgeably so you could handle that, that issue. Some of that may be handled by chapters in the future, but actually communication skills for the power professional that we're seeing now is more important than ever, particularly in terms of stakeholder management, as you mentioned, employee engagement. You know, years ago, I don't think that was as important as it is now, and certainly in the job descriptions we're seeing on a regular basis, that stakeholder management piece, that ability to partner, the relationship management piece is kind of more important than ever. Is that something you're seeing from your side as well? So the people coming to you, the, the ability to communicate at a more senior level as a health professional now rather than just answering queries, so that's something you're seeing in the consulting side. Definitely, and I think that's where the communication bit should focus on. Sure. It's kind of the upward communication rather than, and I don't mean to trivialise it, but it, dealing with employee queries because yeah. most of them are standard yeah, and sure. most of them can be answered by a chatbot. And I think with the sort of generations that are coming through the workforce now, they are much happier interacting with the chatbot. You know, they all speak to each other on WhatsApp anyway. People don't make phone calls anymore. So I think sort of for the employees, call them queries. I think chatbots and technology is fine. But I think, yeah, the communication upwards still needs to, to be a key skill. I think also when it comes to payroll, some people can be actually embarrassed about calling if it's obvious. So sometimes knowing you're dealing with a chatbot is a good thing. Yes. Because you think, actually, no one's going to judge me on my question here, which yes. you know, there's such thing as a silly question. But actually, sometimes you can be nervous about making it as a chatbot. You're a little bit more open to, to putting probably more of a question than you usually would. Yes. Excellent. So final part of the podcast, we're going to open the vault. Entering the vault. One piece of advice you would give to someone working in payroll right now? I would say it's don't be afraid of change. If you're stuck in your ways and have always done things the way you've done them, I think you will struggle, especially with the way that payroll is moving in, sure. in this day and age. Embracing change will ultimately benefit you because it will make your role much more interesting. Again, unless you're one of these people that's quite happy to sit there and, and do data input, getting out and around about the business is going to be much more beneficial to you in your future career. You know, we saw it with HR BPs when they were brought in. Absolutely. You know, why don't we have payroll BPs? Yeah, you know, being much more client facing and much more business focused and business facing. You know, as everyone's saying, it's an exciting time to be in payroll. 
and being at the forefront of change and technology and embracing that is only going to be beneficial to people both in their current careers and their future careers. Fantastic answer. I think it's um, totally agree. I think Power Business Partners is a role that we will start to see coming in, actually, to be fair. Yeah. We're already seeing some change from Power Analysts coming in with big data changing yes. things. I think Power Business Partnering then is probably the next step. And we'll probably use that analytical data yes. the analysts are doing to then you know, use that information and feed up the chain. Great answer. Fantastic. So with the benefit of hindsight, what would be the one career decision you would change? I know everyone says this, but I think if I'm <laughs> honest, I don't think there are any career decisions I would change because I don't think I would be where I am today with the skills and experience I've got if I hadn't have had all the experiences I've had to date. And that includes here with the different projects and, sure. and things I've been involved in. I think there's always the bit around if you think you know more deeply about each of the roles, there's, there's probably situations within each role that you would potentially change the way you interacted with someone or undertook a project. But I think ultimately, I don't think there's anything I would change. It's quite a common answer we're getting at now. Yeah. People obviously love payroll, which is great. If you had the power of foresight, it could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement. What would that action or improvement be? I think it would be integration. I think the fact that there are still systems out there that you can't integrate with each other is ridiculous and it's just causing unnecessary problems within sure. payroll. I think everything should be out of the box integrated with everything else system-wise. Remove a lot of issues within payroll. And we are moving that way. So yeah, sure. we're getting there. Yeah. But there are still some systems that just don't integrate at all. Sure. And it's just causing problems. Who motivates you and why? You've got to motivate yourself. I think in the cold light of day, no one is with you 24 hours a day to be that motivator. You've got to be your own cheerleader um, and drive yourself. There will be people at different stages of life and in different situations that motivate you. But I think ultimately it's got to be yourself. We know Lego masters out there that inspire you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's, it's a difficult area to get into. Sure to be certified Lego good. builder, there's not that many no, in the country. I, I think there's one in the UK. But globally, there's not that many certified Lego builders. So that's the retirement aim. There you go. Heard it here first. If you didn't work in payroll, what would you be doing? I think I've answered that one already. Lego. <laughs> a certified Lego model builder. You'll be number two. Fantastic. <laughs> I'll ask one final question just to finish off at the bar. Why do you love working in payroll? I've always had a financial mind. I like puzzles. Ultimately, when I first started, it was the, the kind of puzzle aspect of it. It's things like implementations and Ties reconciliations. It does, massively. <laughs> when I first started in the implementations, it was when you do the reconciliations, why is this not reconciling? Why is this not balancing? Yeah. What, what's the puzzle part of that? But then it's just a fascinating area. There's always something new. There's always something changing, whether it's a new technology. So with things like the rise of Workday in the UK, we're starting to see much a large number of clients take that, that application up. So we're starting to see a lot more work in that area. It, there's new legislation every year. There's something always going on or changing that keeps it interesting and fresh. So you're excited about the future? I am. As a recruiter, of I'm really excited about the future. I think we've got some exciting goals coming up as well, but um, we don't even know what they look like yet. Mm. My payroll business partner, which yeah. I'm keen to get to, to get to know, but you're excited for the future. Excellent. Well, listen, I want to say a huge thank you to Rebecca for joining us on the Power Podcast today. I hope there's been some really good information there that we can take away from the podcast, talking about the future of the industry. I will highlight a couple of links to the uh, payroll advisory practices that Rebecca runs here, and I'll put those in the episode notes. But if you are listening and want to access them straight away, you can go to www.deloitte.com and well, there's a wealth of information on the Deloitte site and links that you can link to all the payroll tax and HCM practices that they offer. I'll also put a link to Rebecca's LinkedIn profile in the episode notes as well. So if you want to get in contact with Rebecca directly about anything to do with payroll, obviously feel free to, to link in and message Rebecca direct. You've been listening to the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, specialist payroll recruiters. If you would like to feature on a future podcast, please contact us. For a wealth of world-class payroll content, please visit us at jgarecruitment.com. See you next week.